Okay, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Into the Prey, Breaching the Chaos of the Church with, literally, Nick and Mary Franks. Today, um, Mary's with me just because we're, we're going to go through the next few verses of this passage in 1 Corinthians 13, and there's a, a linguistic language um, application that we're going to talk about that's, for those of you who don't know, Mary is a, a French teacher, so um, we're going to go through these next few verses of the chapter. Mary's got a Bible here um, ready, so we're going to maybe highlight a couple of these verses in, at the end of our last chapter, which was chapter 12. Mm-hmm. I'm going to re- refer to that there, so Mary will do that. I've got my Bible here uh, just off screen, so let's go to our Bibles and go through the verses that today we'll focus on with reference to some of these others. So we're looking today at verses 4, 5, 6, and 7 of chapter 13. And last week I read the whole chapter. Today I'm just going to read these few verses and then we'll come back with some thoughts quickly. So jumping in, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Um, So there you have, you have the passage there. Do you want to just, the last verse of chapter 12 from last week. If you've got your Bibles, just refer back to that final verse that Mary's highlighting there from verse 31 of our previous chapter. Um, Remember Paul's longing to see the church eagerly or earnestly desiring the higher gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. We said we'll come to that in the next chapter. But look at the little bit that it says, just that Mary highlighted there, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Mm. And that's why um, it's relevant today from Mary's point of view as a teacher because um, it'd be good just to draw on Mary's experience as a linguist, as a language teacher, because Paul here is is essentially saying, and I will show you a more excellent way. It's like a teacher Mm -hmm. sat next to a student who doesn't get it, (laughs) isn't it? (laughs) It And, (laughs) And the church in Corinth didn't get it they don't they still don't get it as he's come to this part of his letter because he's saying and i will show you still a more excellent way and this bit here is is like the encounter you had recently with a kid um who just didn't get it mhm yeah and it's an interesting example when you teach um i guess anybody who knows about speaking a i guess any foreign language but I speak French, and when you try to explain to young people the difference, the main fundamental difference between French and English in terms of grammar is essential to being able to speak the language. So if you can't grasp um, what is the most basic concept, that nouns in English are only in one category, but in French they're in two, and that is the foundation to understanding how, mm. how essentially how to speak this new language. Mm-hmm. And if you struggle to grasp that concept, everything else that you come across is just really hard to to understand mm-hmm. and then impossible to use because you haven't understood this very kind of basic concept mm-hmm. around the difference in the language. So I spend a lot of my time, <laughs> my time at school just trying to say to kids, you can't ask the question why it is that way. You just have to accept <laughs> that nouns come in two categories in French, and that's just the way it is. And in, in being able to understand that concept, you can then move forward and kind of embrace all the other aspects of learning a language. But without that, everything else just feels like a struggle, you know? Mm-hmm. So the, the example that you'd given, that you'd mentioned to me the other day, was to do with this masculine and feminine thing. Do you want to talk about that in a bit? Yeah. Do you want to come to that in a bit? Yeah. Okay, but the the thing, we're going to call this today the romance language, knowing him more, the romance Mm -hmm. language, knowing him more. And you might think, well, titles don't really matter, but titles sometimes form as we begin to understand, have a sense of um, what to say about something. But 
the I I didn't know this before you told me that those. Mm. Do you want to just say something about those Romance languages? Yeah, I did, well, Romance languages are the all the languages that are closely linked together. So, in Europe, so French, Spanish, Italian, I'd Romanian. Never, I'd never known. I'd never heard that. Yeah, and they're called Romance languages, and I, I actually didn't know why until I specifically looked it up today. But they come from a certain part of Latin. And they kind of develop. So they're very closely linked. So, for example, if if I read something in Spanish or try to read something in Spanish, I can get a, a gist of it because it's quite closely linked with French. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's a kind of a similarity amongst them. It was more of a side note anecdote, but yeah. <laughs> n- n- nonetheless one that was quite, quite interesting because, of course, we're looking... It, it, we're not trying to be contrived here. We're trying to be very careful not to be contrived, mm. but obviously we're talking about love. And these these four verses... Um, in a similar way that we could have gone through each of the individual gifts of the Spirit in the previous chapter, you know, verse by verse, gift by gift. We're, we're kind of doing more broad thoughts here, I think, and I, I think that's okay, be- partly because it's beyond the realm of the limited time that we have, and also it encourages people to go away and actually do that for yourselves, mm-hmm. dig in beyond um, what these sessions are, which are really just introductory, I think just introductory Sessions, you might think, well, you're taking a long time, Franks, to do an introduction to 1 Corinthians. You've been doing it for a year. But um, anyway, these, these, these verses today, we want to talk about la- the Romance languages and, and use that as, a, a, I think, a helpful learning aid as we go. But the um, let's talk about the verses again, just to make some obvious comments here. I'll pull up the Bible again so you can see. But if you're looking at verse... Let's start at the at the back end. So first of all, um, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's one of the Pauline um, traits of of repetition that he does, and he uh, he kind of goes through these verses, and I think it's a mirror again, once again, into that community, into the community that we're really supposed to be focusing on. You know, the the reality is that Paul wouldn't need to be saying any of these things if if the church were in a place of maturity. Um, for example, let me just give you one example. Look at verse 6, just here. I don't know if you're, you're, you're struggling a little bit with the... Do you want me to do it? Are you okay? Mm. Verse 6, look at look at what he says there. That love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. You kind of think... I, I, I find myself at least thinking, why would Paul need to say that? Why mm-hmm. would Paul need to point out something as obvious that love love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing? Yeah. Unless there was some kind of, unless it was a mirror into the community mm. here, which is to say that they—that's exactly, that's precisely what they were doing, um, and yet they were loving the loving, um, loving to talk about the gift of tongues and prophesying and all these greater gifts, and yet they were still rejoicing at wrongdoing. And there was something profoundly twisted, I think, about mm. that. Um, the big thought that I want us to, to think about today. A couple of things I think would be to say one is that it's it's a reflection of the community, and I think in this in a, in a profound sense, it's a reflection of our own communities today. The general understanding of what what constitutes church and that we believe is being disrupted, mm-hmm. which is why if we come to something like this in a kind of laissez faire um, kind of familiar way, we're missing so much because. We should be all. We should all be able to come to the Bible. In a sense, every time we come, to, every single time we come to the Bible, and ask Him for the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation, mm. even if it, even if there was nothing particularly significant going on in the church. But the reality is, there is something. Yeah, we believe, and I'm and I'm sure everybody tuning into this podcast believes there's something very significant going on. So another, what I'm trying to say is that it, it kind of heightens that sense in which as we come to these passages, mm. particularly perhaps the ones that we know, we think we know the best, we need to be prepared that we've missed something. We need to be prepared. Um, do you know what, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That. Yeah. So if this passage, and I think that's typically what has happened, has become detached from Christian community, um, we're not un- we're not able to come to understand i think what paul wanted them to know and what we should be learning today you know mm-hmm. h- hence when it's just a passage read and it's such a weird thing if you think about how different the context of a, of a i don't know a, just to say a church of england um 
wedding ceremony compared with the nitty gritty of Corinthian. I know. Immature <laughs> image. Yeah. You know, it's, they're very different. They're very different. Yeah. I always had a tutor. I had a tutor at uni who used to talk about this passage and say that he thought it was hilarious that it was used at weddings because if you read the passage in context, it's almost like Paul's reached a point where he's so he's like kind of at the end of his tether almost. Mm -hmm. Like this is like he's gone through this all these things that are wrong with the community and then has got to this point where it's like, this is it, this is what you need to do. It's like this is how you show that you're part of a Christian community rather than mm -hmm. a kind of romantic idea of what. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just I don't know. Um, I wonder how many people have actually experienced this. I mean, I, I think I mentioned last week about coming to Romans 12 in a sense that's a, uh, just maybe see if I can quickly flick to it as I'm here now, but it's a kind of similar passage in the way that it showcases the way that Christian community is supposed to be. You know, verses 9 through to 21 of Romans 12, the marks of a true, true Christian, and it just says things like, let love be genuine. Hmm. You know, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in mm. showing honour. So that, that passage continues, but it's, I think it's a, a, a slightly more nuanced passage mm -hmm. for this. But I think the point being, um, how how many of us really understand this this thing that we think about and talk about so often called love or agape, you know, and the different, the multifaceted nature of, of the word that mm -hmm. in our English language can be quite stunted yeah, because we just have one word. And yeah, we don't it. have the, the co sort of complexity of language that maybe other languages mm -hmm. do, yeah. But um, love is patient, and this is our passage, so love is patient and kind. So I'm, I'm thinking, like, like we'd said last week, that um, Paul was first and foremost thinking of himself, you know, where he referred in the first person to, if I speak in the tongues of men and mm. of angels. So maybe Paul is doing that here in the same sense, that love is patient and kind. He needs to be patient and mm. kind with these... With these... With people. these idiots. Yeah. These guys who, who rejoice at wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Verse 6. But the, the, other, the other thing I should have said at the beginning of this is to explain why Mary's doing... We're doing this together today is because of the coming-of-age nature of this passage... And if you remember last time I, I mentioned verse 11, it says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child and I thought like a child. And I talk about bar mitzvah. And I qualified that in the notes for anybody wondering if I'd forgotten the fact that both chapters and verses are, are kind of artificial in one sense. They wouldn't have been there in Paul's original writing. And yet there's still there's still a mysterious sense in which this seems to fit very much, doesn't it, with the, the coming of age thought, with it falling at, 1313 13 and the Jewish significance of that anyway I'm not get, I'm not getting distracted by that but today I I just want us to focus on one big thought which is to say that he loved us first you know he's mm. loved us first 1 John 4:19 we love because he first loved us and I think that's as we come to this and think, okay, essentially what normally happens is you come and you think, okay, I, love is patient. Okay, I need to be more patient. Mm -hmm. Love is kind. I need to, I need to be kinder. Yeah. Um, it's not rude. Okay, I need to stop being rude. Um, it does not insist on its own way. That's, you know, I think we tend to think of... Working harder. <laughs> working harder. Yeah. yeah. And that, that that is actually not what we're supposed to do here. I don't think that's the answer. Rather... 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved mm -hmm. us, which means to say doing any of this is impossible were it not for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think there's, um, there is, of course, an element of being mindful of these things, of, of really engaging with the passage and thinking about it and what does it mean, what do these words mean. Um, but I, th I think, yeah, that you're saying it's we, we can't drum this up um, from within ourselves, our sense of really loving comes from our own understanding of knowing him and being loved by him. And it's from that place that we're really able to mm -hmm. to understand what that means. And this is the example of, of the kid that couldn't understand the masculine and the feminine because conceptually he, he just couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... I think that's why it's a good example for us today is because when we come to, to these v verses that we all have heard hundreds of times, 
as we're saying, if if we think we just we just need to be more patient and kinder and you know, when, when that's not the invitation here. The invitation I think is to understand how first how love the order of things here is so so important that that we only love we can only come to this chapter because he first loved us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the kid, that kid who didn't understand the masculine and feminine, is a good example of that, isn't it? Yeah, though I, th- I think probably the the bigger picture of learning a new language mm. is is a a kind of a really good parallel because as you know as we were speaking about this earlier, there's as you, when you become a Christian and you become part of a Christian community, part of the body, you're essentially entering into an entirely new culture, mm-hmm. aren't you? Or you should be like your whole mindset your whole your language your culture everything should be like when you were in nice yeah like everything should be transformed and the the parallel of learning a language when you move abroad and you you you're embedded in a new a totally new way of life a totally new language a totally new culture and it takes a really long time in some respects to kind of take all this stuff on and but eventually it becomes um, you change the your thinking changes, mm-hmm. so you start thinking in a new language, and then you start dreaming in the new language, mm-hmm. and and suddenly you have this this new understanding of the world in one sense. And I, I think that's a good parallel with being becoming part of the body of Christ is that you've moved from one culture into another. And I think what Paul is trying to help the church see in this passage is that love is not what we think it is from the worldly sense. It's our understanding of what love is comes from Jesus himself. And that that in, as we've Mm -hmm. just said, as in in knowing him, we are then able to understand the meaning of these words. And they take on, they just take on a new understanding, which should change the way that we think and act and live, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Love bears all things, l- believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So there's there's a combination here of Paul saying love is certain things. So there's positives and mm. then there's this bunch of things that love is not. Um, and I, th- I think this, this understanding of learning a language, like you refer to this thing called overload training. Is that, how, is that Yeah, but I think that's actually a, um, a physical exercise thing <laughs> rather it? than a language thing. So it's I think overload training is when you like push your yeah, I thought you, you do were, too much. Well, it's it's a yeah. It, but it, the it, concept I think I think you could essentially apply it because when you like when I moved to France, you are suddenly completely immersed in an environment where nothing makes sense anymore, and your brain has to go into overdrive mm-hmm. to try and do everything. Mm-hmm. In and you're constantly trying to to reorientate your thinking and to to learn new words and then to you know all the, everything is just new and different and difficult. Yeah. But essentially, that's that's how you learn. It's in the doing of it that helps you to to learn the language. Yeah, just to, the deep end, the proverbial deep end. Yeah. You sink mm-hmm. or sink or swim. Yeah, lots of sinking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can imagine. Ich kann ihn nicht leiden, er ist weil es zu langweilig ist. Um, doesn't mean anything. Well, it does, but I can't remember what it means. <laughs> <laughs> it's not much good, is it, if you don't know what it means? Um, so this this is what we're saying, is that this is a coming-of-age chapter. Um, and within what is a very well-known passage, we have to be a mi- mindful of the point in history that we're at. And the Romans 12 passage what that's got to say to help us put a bit of flesh on this bones. But in terms of these four verses, I'm, I'm trying to do a bit of actual exegesis as well as talking more broadly around um, the chapter and the book and the series. Love love is a certain way and it's, and it's also a, not a certain way. Next mm-hmm. week when we're coming through to these verses, um, eight through to the end of the chapter, Paul then begins to start talking about the... the the kind of the broader nature of love and that kind of thing. But I think for the purposes of today, as we think about this example of children learning a language and that not being something that is 
that most of the time doesn't ev- doesn't result in a fluency. You know, kids mm. don't eventually go on into the culture and become embedded. And well, it, that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? Fluency of mm-hmm. this chapter. Paul yeah. wants these guys to be fluent in love. Exactly. Which, yeah. which means. Paul wants them to be fluent in understanding, first of all, how much they are loved. Mm-hmm. And our point today is very simple, I think, that rather than it being this thing of like, we we must do these things, which tend to be quite sporadic. OK, we've, we're have we at a wedding. We might feel like, oh, we, we need to make a bit more effort because our covenant vows mean X, Y and Z. Yeah. We, we need to be a bit more patient with our spouses. Um, but, at, but actually, no, what, what we're saying is that unless we come to a place of accepting that our poverty of loving one another is a direct reflection Mm. of our poverty of understanding how much we have been loved, we will never actually change Mm -hmm. beyond those kind of sporadic peaks and troughs. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're saying. And so in that sense, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved Mm -hmm. us. Um, Does that make sense? This is where it'd be nice to be in a room with other people <laughs> because you could actually ask them and um, just have a little bit of feedback. But I, th- I think, I think that's really it for this passage: is that um, love never ends, as we'll come to next week, mm-hmm. and then the way that Paul blends starts to bleed into talking about prophecy and so on. Um, but I don't know for the folk listening. Um, what what are your thoughts about this as you as you read through these verses love love is patient and kind do you first think okay what where am i at with my with my love or do you do you perhaps think how much am i aware of his patient love for me mm. his the kindness of his love for me The humility of his love for me. You know, love is not arrogant. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the opposite of rude? Polite. You don't think of God as being no, polite. No, you don't think. <laughs> Warm, I guess. Courteous. Mm-hmm. You know, dignity, dignified. Mm-hmm. Respectful. Um, is, yeah. do, do we first think of God like that being being like that towards us these are all little keys that help us to then realize that actually that's the only way of being more like this is 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 realizing how much he is like this for us first Mm -hmm. it does not love does not insist on its own way um the selflessness of love of his love for us i mean at the cross shown most preeminently you know not my will father but yours your will be done Love does not insist on its own way. It submits to a higher a higher authority, a higher love. Hmm. Uh, it's not irritable or resentful. Um, do we do we think of God being all of these opposites as the key to us becoming the way that love actually is? The only hmm. way that we love is by knowing that He's loved us first. And as we read last week, Romans five. He's he's put his spirit into our hearts, and that's that's the only way that we know how to love. Um, just want to say, I think in closing, quickly on this point about um, it does not insist on its own way. There's a, there's a, a word here just for husbands, particularly husbands, particularly men, particularly from Ephesians five, and this calling to love our wives like Christ loved the church. I just alluded there to the the ultimate selflessness, the ultimate self giving. You know, that's there is a call here as men to to serve and love our wives um, uniquely. And I don't want to go into that other than just to, to flag it. You know, I'm thinking of Romans 12. I'm also thinking of Ephesians 5 here. I mm-hmm. think it's I think it's worth just saying that. Is there anything else you wanted to say, sweet? No, I don't think so. I think just as you read the, those, that passage and the words, I think, I think um, trying to take it out of the context of wedding is really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I feel that just the the sacrificial nature of love that is is far more a, a doing action than it is a feeling. And I think just remembering that Paul was speaking specifically to a group of people and that love was to be expressed in an in an action essentially. And I I, I just find that um 
it, it's really helpful to think about removing love from our culture and thinking about what our biblical perspective of it is. Yeah. And and also to say in closing that we can't, again, it's worth just saying we've just spent however many weeks looking at the gifts of the Spirit. And, you know, we don't detach. We're not, you know, love is a fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately the gifts that he gives are a gift of a person and the fruit that he he cultivates is a, is the fruit of a person. And this is ultimately love. And Paul has said, didn't he? Again, looking back, let's just look back here again as at the back end of chapter 12. Paul makes it very clear that the greatest of these is love. Mm -hmm. You know, the greatest of these fruits yeah. is love. Um, sorry, was that in the back end of verse t chapter 12? No, it's right at the end of chapter 13. It's right at the end um, that the greatest of these is love. Mm. So this fruit that he's, Paul is uh, over time working on, you know, to see that these guys become more fruitful. The John, the John 15 mm. is ultimately, I think, how we are supposed to come. And it's, 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 it's humbling, isn't it? All of this is very mm. humbling. Because we realise how naturally unloving we are, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it, you know we need him to to give us this fruit mm -hmm. as much as we need these gifts, and we shouldn't, we certainly shouldn't be longing eagerly for the gifts of um, the gifts, you know, prophecy in tongues, and just being kind of like well, whatever regarding the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting thought that just come to me there. If Paul puts on a pedestal these gifts of the spirit of prophecy and so on. Mm -hmm then I know it's not stated, but I think it, it wouldn't be necessarily wrong to think of love in that in that parallel way to prophecy. We're supposed to be eagerly desiring the gift of prophecy, and Paul is saying here that the greatest of these is love. Love, yeah. So prophecy and love are very closely related. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting thought, yeah. Yeah. Let's just pray. Father, we, we just want to acknowledge before you as we've looked at this in this small room in Edinburgh with very little space and struggling to get our thoughts in line with you that you are constantly working in us by your spirit and you love it like you like any earthly parent would would love peering into the bedroom of a child seeing them playing with the gifts that they'd been given and so lord we just acknowledge before you now that we don't love in the way that you would want us to that would be a true, genuine, faithful reflection of the way that we've been loved. And we know that we can't have any right thought about you mm. oh, without your work in us that is just sheer grace. Mm. And so we say thank you, Lord, for loving us, especially while we were still your enemy, especially while we were separated from you. Thank you for loving us then. Mm. And perhaps that's the... if. If love is the crescendo of the of the fruit, perhaps the crescendo of that love is the cross. Forget, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Mm. Let us, at this point in history, as you disrupt your people, as you disrupt the understanding of what Christian means, disciple means, church means, that there would be this growth, not just in a, a kind of token sentimentality of love but ultimately of the kind of love that is maligned and marred beyond human likeness mm. that there would be a father forgive them they just don't know what they're doing they just they just can't see they just can't hear lord let that be the characteristic nature of what you're doing in your people at this time mm. love is patient and lord i pray that there would be patience for ourselves as you disrupt us, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Father, we just thank you for this understanding, these words of what love is and for the sacrificial love that you showed us on the cross, Lord. And we pray that as we think about these, this passage in particular and the words in it, I pray that it would have a deep effect on our understanding of who you are 
and the importance of these verses in the midst of gifts and the spirit and everything related to it, Lord, I just pray that they would they would sit in us deeply and we would have a greater understanding of how love should lead our communities and how love should distinguish us, Lord, as your people. Father, we just thank you for your word today and yeah. we thank you for being able to read it and talk about it and think about it and just the goodness that it does our hearts and our minds when we do that, Lord. Mm. And we just pray for everyone who's listening mm. to this podcast, mm. Lord, that you would just bless them deeply through meditation on your word, mm. Lord. And we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen.